This is section 9.3, Separable Equations, and our second content objective is to solve story problems involving separation of variables. By the time we're done, I would like you to be able to explain the relationship between the horizontal asymptotes of the solution curves and the equilibrium solutions of the original differential equations. Our first example is to let the velocity be the velocity in feet per second of a skydiver at time t seconds, where t is positive. After her parachute opens, her velocity satisfies the differential equation given here, with the initial condition v of 0 equals negative 50. Our first part is to find that velocity in terms of t, and we're going to use separation of variables to accomplish that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the tt to the right hand side. When I do that, notice that the v is now multiplied by dt, so I cannot add it to the other side to move it. Instead, I have to divide. And I have a choice. I can divide the entire thing, or I could divide a v plus a 16 and leave the negative 2 behind. Now, as I'm thinking about this, my goal is to create something that is easy as possible to integrate. So if I moved this negative 2 over, then that would make the denominator more complicated than it needs to be, whereas leaving it here, it's pretty easy to go backwards. So I'm going to choose to separate this way so that I can then answer the questions posed by the integral symbols rather quickly. What did I take the derivative of with respect to v that gave me 1 over v plus 16? Well, that's the log natural of the absolute value of v plus 16. On the other side, what did I take the derivative of with respect to t that gave me negative 2? That's a negative 2t plus a random constant. Now again, I am at the crossroads. I can either plug in my initial condition now and then isolate v, or I can isolate v first and then plug in the point. Because my antiderivative involves a log, I'm going to choose to isolate the v first. So the first thing I will do in order to get that v alone is I will make both sides into exponents of e. When I do that, the e and log natural will cancel, and I'll be left with the absolute value of v plus 16 equals e to the negative 2t plus some constant. The next thing I want to move is the absolute value. To get rid of that, I will realize that what comes out of this could have started as a positive or a negative. So that means what's inside could either be plus or minus e of this negative 2t plus c. Lastly, in order to get v alone, I would subtract 16 from both sides. Now looking at this, it seems pretty messy. It doesn't seem like it would have been any better to isolate v than it would have been to just plug in the point. So I'm going to illustrate how it's actually nicer for you to do it this way by thinking about the properties of exponentials. If we remember that e's raised to sums is the same as an e raised to that negative 2t times an e raised to the c, then I can rewrite this as v equals a negative 16 plus or minus an e to the c times and e to the negative 2t. Now here's where we do a bit of hand waving that's kind of slick because we have yet to nail down this c. It is a random constant. That means e raised to that random constant is in turn going to be a random constant. Similarly, if I do plus or minus and pick one of them, that too will just be a random constant. So we can label these all as c sub 1's and then we can replace this entire piece as a simple c sub 2. When I do that, now plugging in the initial condition makes it pretty simple to find that c, and I just have to find the coefficient as opposed to having to find this exponent of an e. I'll see that my velocity is a negative 50 when my t is a 0. e to the 0 is just a 1, so I get a negative 50 equals a negative 16 plus a c sub 2, 
which means c sub 2 is going to be a negative 34. Again, we see here that from this piece where we had pluses or minuses that we are selecting the negative branch because of the initial condition that we have to satisfy. If we look now at part B, our goal is to find the terminal velocity, which is the limit of this as time goes to infinity. So if I look at the limit as t gets very large on this velocity curve, I'll be looking at the limit as t goes to infinity of negative 16 minus 34 e to the negative 2t. If t gets very, very large, that means the exponent of e is approaching negative infinity, or this entire term will become 1 over e to a positive very large number, which is going to go to 0. So this particular piece of it will end up heading towards 0, so my limit will just be that negative 16 that is left. With part C, it says it is safe to land when her speed is 20 feet per second. So let's remember that speed is the absolute value of the velocity. And our terminal velocity was negative 16, and our initial velocity was negative 50. Our velocity has been negative the entire time because we are falling and we are traveling down. So if we want the speed to be 20, that means the velocity is going to be negative 20. So we are solving for when that negative 20 equals the negative 16 minus minus 34 e to the negative 2t. Now this could be given to you as a non-calculator problem, which would require you to isolate the t without your calculator, and we'll have the answer as an exact value as opposed to a decimal approximation. So I can add 16 to both sides. I can divide by negative 34. I can then take the log of both sides, and then divide by a negative 2. So I'd end up getting t equals that one-half, or negative one-half, or we could make this into the exponent. They're all kind of the same form, so we'll just do this. Or it could be one-half the positive log of 34 fourths, or it could be the log natural of the square root of 34 fourths, however you want to write it. With example two, we have to do a bit of translating. We have to take these words and convert them into a differential equation that we will then solve using separation of variables. So here it says, let p of t represent the number of wolves in a population at time t years when t is positive. The population p is increasing at a rate, so that means my dp dt that is directly proportional to, so that means it equals a constant times the thing it's proportional to. Well, that's the 800 minus the p, where the constant of proportionality is k. So now they've given us a point, and they want us to find p. So this is an initial value problem, and we're going to solve it by separating. We'll move the dt to the right, and then we will move the factor involving the p to the left. When we integrate now, we can see that on the right hand side, I'll simply get a kt plus a c, because what did I take the derivative of with respect to t that gave me k? kt plus c. On the left side, it's a little trickier, because we need to do a substitution method. So that's going to require us to identify our u and our dp. Most of you probably already see that this is going to be some variation of a log natural. The issue is, is that we don't just have a regular p down here. We've got something involving p. So we can let u equal 800 minus p, which means that du dp will be negative 1, and it will mean dp will equal negative du. So if I replace what's in the boxes, with what they equal in terms of u, I actually end up with a negative log natural of the absolute value of u 
which was 800 minus P. So over on this left side, the antiderivative will be the opposite of the log natural of the absolute value of 800 minus P. Now my goal is to find P in terms of T. So now I am again at that crossroads. I can either isolate P now and then plug in the initial condition to solve for C, or I can plug in the initial condition first and then isolate the P. Because my antiderivative involves a log, I'm probably going to have an easier time of it if I isolate the P first. So this is going to work a lot like the one that we just did in example one. In order to isolate the P, the first thing I move is the negative. And keep in mind that a opposite of a random constant is just another random constant. Then I move the log by making both sides into exponents. That will give me this. Then I move the absolute value by putting a plus or minus on the other side. And then I move the 800 by subtracting it. And then I move the negative. Now I've got P isolated, but the right side looks pretty nasty. So to fix it, I'm going to rewrite this using the properties of exponentials. And I'm going to realize that I'll have minus or plus e to the c sub 2 times that e to the negative kt. And I'm going to remember that this is just another random constant. So I can write p equals 800 plus c sub 3 times e to the negative kt. Now I'm ready to plug in my point. I get 500 out when I plug in 0 for time. So I now know that C3 is negative 300 and I can write my P. I have P in terms of K and T. So for part B, I'm given a second point that will help me nail down the K. So they told me that the output of P is 700 when time was 2. So if I want to isolate my K, I'll move the 800 over. Then I'll move the negative 300. Then I'll move the E. And then I'll move the negative 2. So let's look at what that is. K is going to be a negative 1 half log natural of 1 third. Or we could rewrite that as a positive 1 half log natural of 3. And this will make a little more sense when I put it into the formula. So up here now, I'll have P of T is now 800 minus 300 e to the opposite of my k times t. Now I would caution you against writing the t at the back because you might think that it's inside the log natural, so you might want to, want to multiply that coefficient by a t. Now looking at this, we can see that e is raised to a negative number as t gets larger, so it's actually going to be shrinking as time goes on, and our goal is to find the limit of it as t gets larger and larger. So as t gets larger and larger, we're going to see that this particular term gets closer and closer to zero, so the limiting value will be 800 wolves. So let's think about what that's telling us. We've got this number of wolves. The population increases. In other words, we're reproducing and creating more little baby wolves until we start to run out of resources for the wolves. If they don't have anything to eat, we're not going to be able to have more wolves. So eventually the population is going to level out at this number of 800 because that's how much the environment in which the wolves are living can support.